should be all good to go. Um, let me check if the recording is running. Yes, very good. All right, so welcome everyone to the first lecture of bioinformatics for plants and animals, something like that. Um, it's a German name, but I always call it the bioinformatics course. Um, so today will be a short lecture, like we didn't start at 8, we start at 9, uh, which is good, I think. Like I don't like starting at 8 in the morning, and I think also for you guys it's not a very good time to start. Um, so what are we going to do today? Um, so what are we going to do? There will be some general course announcements, uh, which is really just some announcements. Um, we will have a little poll as well. Um, so the poll will be so that you guys can decide on a new time slot for the lecture. Um, then there will be an introduction into bioinformatics, which will be kind of a short history for people like the Power of the Weakness that actually followed the R course in the summer semester. Um, there will be some repetition, which is fine, I think, um, because only by repetition people learn. Um, and then we will have a short break after the introduction, and then we will do in the second hour a, a, a microarray overview. So I will just explain to you have what where a bioinformatician is involved in a microarray experiment um, and then we will have an overview of the coming lectures and the overview of the coming lectures will actually just show you what you can learn when you continue following the course all right so like I announced we will first have a poll um, I think that um, Eight, from 8 to 11 is just a, a horrible time. Um, people have to wake up early. Um, hey, Commando, welcome to the stream. Um, so from 8, uh, from 8 to 11 is just a horrible time. Um, I actually don't know why they cut my course by an hour. Uh, normally we would have four hour lectures, but apparently when it went on to Agnes, people made it a three hour lecture. So. Um, but that's fine with me. Three hours is long enough and um, usually the slides will be only two hours um, and then there will be like an hour for exercises so that we can have some exercises together. Um, the way that I think we should do this is um, since I have no one on the Zoom meeting I can just ignore that altogether. So I would say just throw into the chat what is your um, preferred time slot and I will just tabulate the votes and then we will see which time slot is the best for everyone. Um, so let's just throw in some times. All right, so that's the first vote for 14 to 17. All right, let's vote for 10 to 13. 14 to 17, second vote. 1 to 13. All right, good morning, Sandra. 10 to 13. Salma, 12 to 15. Commando, 10 to 13. All right, any more? You can do it, people. Like, there should be more people in the chat. Like, I'm registering 15 viewers at the moment, so. Um, if you want to remain the silent majority, don't vote, then that's fine with me. So currently, if I'm tabulating well, we have four votes for the 10 to 13 slot. Um, Misha doesn't really have an opinion. Okay. All right, so then I think it is decided and we will go for the 10 to 13 time slot, um, which is perfectly fine with me then. At least I can have a sandwich. <laughs> Power of the weakness. Easier than the US election. Um, all right, so there's one person who has a lecture until 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock in the morning on Thursdays. Yeah, well, we won't change the, um, the day. I think that that's a little bit too much because then, un unless everyone says like, oh, I'm free on like Tuesday and then we can actually move it to Tuesday. All right, the fish guys have lectures until 12 o'clock. All right, I have a lecture as well, so 14 to... All right, so is, if, if we just 
see so now it gets interesting again like and it never say that it's easier than the US elections it's actually turning out to be a little bit more difficult so if the people that voted for 10 to 13 like power of the weakness Lydia and um, for example commando are you okay with moving it to the afternoon so going to the 12 to 15 slot or going to the 14 to 17 slot all right power of the weakness says yes no problem all right then um, I'm making an executive order executive decision here um, and then it will be from 2 to 5 um, which is really nice because then when I finish streaming I can go home directly um, so that's uh, that's nice All right, yes, thank you all for the votes. Um, then 14 to 17 it is, and we'll keep it at that. Um, all right, good. Next slide. All right, like uh, like uh, every time, um, the slides will and the recording will be made available on Moodle. Um, I'm always saying that attendance is obligatory, um, and uh, the, the, that's of course not really obligatory because I can't force you guys to be here. Um, but um, I, I I think that it's it's good to earn a bonus for when people show up for most of the lectures. So um, generally, you will get like one wrong answer on the exam kind of ignored by following all the lectures um, so I think that that's a nice bonus um, so generally there's like 40 ish questions um, and just having one of these questions wrong will mean that you can still get a one um, which is really nice um, so some lectures will contain practical exercises the lecture for today is a very easy exercise it shouldn't take you more than like 10 minutes um, but the other lectures will have much more practical exercises and I'm still a little bit unsure on how I want to do that um, because from my experience with the R course um, people who don't do the lectures either drop out halfway or they fail the exam um, so I'm very interested in people doing the assignments so the, the practical exercises which belong to the lectures um, so I might actually make quizzes on Moodle uh, so had just have like a PDF with the assignments and then on Moodle you have to answer like or you have to fill in like three of the of the answers and then after filling in three of the answers you kind of unlock uh, the rest of the lecture um, I don't like gating stuff between like these things so um, it might be that you just have to fill in like three out of five questions or the answers to three out of five questions on Moodle and that not doing it is just uh, that there's no penalty um, or I might decide that there might be a bonus so if people do all the assignments uh, then you get a bonus so instead of being allowed to have like a question on the exam um, ignored or a wrong question on the exam ignored um, but I think it's very important that people do the practical exercises we're we're having practical exercises because it's kind of a practical course I want people to learn something and I want people to have like a um, a new skill set when you're done um, yeah, because that's what bioinformatics is it's just different skill sets um, so all right so since we decided and I think everything is clear here um, so I'm not gonna hold attendance but um, we will kind of write down who's in the lectures and, and that make sure that um, people who are following the lectures um, will get a bonus all right so a question then for you guys um, what do you think is bioinformatics because bioinformatics is a massively broad um, ooh, let me see this is annoying because now the bottom part of the slide is not really visible let me move it a little 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 bit all right, good. So because bioinformatics is a really, really broad field um, and there's many, many different 
bioinformatics fields and I actually want to know from you guys more or less what is your experience with bioinformatics have you done any bioinformatics before um, for example did you follow the R course um, because the R course itself is of course just a programming course um, but hey it, it's good that I get at least an idea of um, if people have some programming experience um, if people for example know how to work with things like ensemble um, are there people who did like protein protein docking predictions or these kinds of things um, so it would be nice if you could just throw into the chat any experience that you have or what you think bioinformatics is um, I, I really think that it, it it helps me to kind of plan the next lectures like if everyone says well I know what DNA is I know how to use ensemble um, I, I, I know how to automatically download sequences or these kinds of things hey, then then we don't have to go into that in detail um, so hey, it helps me to kind of streamline the coming lectures um, so that people kind of know or so that I know what what people know um, stays eerily quiet in chat so no experience like I know that some of you guys uh, problem solving on a biological level statistical methods for biological data so that's what you want to learn or that's something that you already know how to do um, So in my view, bioinformatics is more or less the use of um, tools that come from like software development. So using software tools or uh, using like big databases with biological data uh, to answer questions. All right. So you find that that's yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that um, statistics is a big part, um, but it's not the only part. Um, there's a lot of pieces of bio or there's a lot of fields in bioinformatics where statistics actually does not really play a role um, yeah, for example if I'm making video recordings um, of animals in a forest then that is part of bioinformatics right I have for example 10 to 20 cameras um, and I have to kind of use the 10 to 20 cameras um, get the videos from there and then have like a software program which kind of and analyzes which animals are in the forest. Um, all right, so someone already has some experience with R and statistical methods. Um, so the thing that that um, that I usually see is that when you when you ask people what does a bioinformatician do, then people think that bioinformaticians are always like this this gorilla um, and just using a computer and of course not every biologist that uses a computer is a bioinformatician um, just like every bioinformatician is not directly a biologist um, all right um, Atul Bay participated in the R course bit of experience with R I want to learn to get information from ensemble okay so that's good I will write that down get info from ensemble and then you probably want to get that in R, right? Because, um, all right, can I har R and I'm learning Python. That's really, really good. Um, I think Python is a very, very strong second language to learn besides R. Um, and so for coming back to the slide, what, what, what does a bioinformatician do? Well, a bioinformatician is, is always sitting behind a computer, like this nice photo of me um, sitting behind my, my old setup. Um, so hey, there is a big computer component in bioinformatics, but there are fields of bioinformatics where you don't necessarily use a computer. Um, coming up with new algorithms or coming up with new ways to analyze data um, can be done on paper and a lot of these things can be done beforehand um, before you even touch your computer so a couple of other slides like I said bioinformatics is a very broad field and I'm really interested in what you guys want to learn um, so if you have for example a project that you're currently working on and have, for example I'm doing microRNA discovery um, then of course we can have a lecture about that um, if you're saying I'm working on protein-protein interactions, we can have a specific lecture about that. 
Um, so hey, you don't have to come up with this now, um, but if you come up with a topic where you think like, oh, this would be a really nice topic to have a lecture about. Um, all right, Skarita, I work with DNA sequences mainly, but not much with proteins. All right, so do you want to have a lecture then that, that's more about proteins um, and how to work with things like protein sequences? Um, because we can kind of accommodate that. Right, and that's that's the idea behind the course. Is since we're streaming it and we're doing it live, then we can just talk about the things. Um, all right, Verwendung for Zuchtung. That's a very good one. So the usage of of bioinformatics in breeding. And that's also what the course is about mainly. Um, so we will do that. Um, there's already a lecture about. QTL mapping, so how to associate parts of the genome with, for example, traits that are important for, um, well, for example, in the milk industry, like milk production, um, or when you're thinking about plants, to make plants more resistant to pests or to make them yield more, um, more crops. Um, so there is already a big breeding component in that, but I will write it down, so breeding and I will definitely make sure that we get a little bit more focus then on the breeding part. Um, so, um, good. Skorita answered, we also want to do something about proteins. Um, there's already a lecture about proteins, but I will make it a little bit more applied and I will make sure then that the protein lecture kind of couples back to the DNA lecture. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, because both are sequences and so many of the tools that you're using um, is uh, many of the tools that you use for DNA sequence analysis you can use very similar tools for protein sequence analysis as well um, of course the nice thing about proteins is is that you have to deal with things like 3d structure of proteins as well um, which is not very obvious if you just look at the primary sequence and when you analyze DNA, we generally don't care about the 3D structure um, unless there's very weird things going on. Um, we, but generally we assume that if you talk about DNA, you're talking about a double helix. Um, but in proteins, it's of course not the case because proteins can take all kinds of shapes and forms. And uh, that's interesting um, and hey, very important as well for the, for the, for the, for the function of proteins. All right, so we have a couple of topics. Um, I will go through the list of topics that I had set up at the end of the lecture. Those are all old lectures, and of course we can always change something uh, when we want to do that. All right, so a definition, more formal definition of bioinformatics. I just got this from Wikipedia, um, which is of course not the best source of information, but if you're just looking for like a general idea of what is what, then Wikipedia tends to be a very, very good tool. So I will just read it. So bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field. So that means that it connects things like biology uh, with computer science, or it connects things like proteomics with AI. So in, in bioinformatics, there's a big interdisciplinary component. Bioinformaticians generally have either a bachelor with two minors, so uh, a bachelor which, with a major on biology and a minor on, for example, computer science. Um, but there's also a lot of people from, for example, physics that have a bachelor in physics uh, that do a master in bioinformatics, um, which is because physicists generally are very good programmers, or at least they get taught how to program during their physics lectures. They, they tend to end up um, in bioinformatics um, because physics is a really hard field to make a name for yourself, while bioinformatics is generally considered to be a little bit easier. The nice thing about bioinformatics is, is that you don't have to be the best programmer in the world to be a very good bioinformatician um, and you don't have to be the best biologist in the world and you just have to be able to kind of connect these two fields together um, and know how to talk to computer scientists on the one hand and talk to biologists on, on the other hand. So hey, you're kind of an intermediate between uh, fields like biology, um, mathematics, engineering, statistics. Um, so, yeah, but the most important part is, is that you use tools that are developed in computer science to answer biological questions. And one of the core things in bioinformatics is, is that you're generally dealing with a tremendous amount of data. Um, so had, like when we're talking about 
bioinformatic analysis, we generally talk about data sets which are not easily analyzed in things like Microsoft Excel um, or other tools like um, GraphPad, um, which is a nice tool in itself, um, but it's just a way to make graphs. And just like Excel is a good way of storing some intermediate data, but not a very good way to do like uh, massive pipelines where you analyze sequencing data. Um, although you could, but it's generally not advised to do that. So some definitions, um, so just that you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, when I'm saying the word algorithm, I generally mean like a cooking recipe that you can follow to answer a certain question. Um, in the bioinformatics course, uh, or uh, in, the, in the R programming course that we had in the summer semester, we have a much broader definition, but I think this definition is, is sufficient for uh, when we're talking about bioinformatics. Um, so we have something called data, which is a set of values of quantitative or quant qualitative or quantitative variables. And so that means things like, um, and so we'll go into more detail about the definitions in other lectures, but hey, qualitative means that you are ascribing a quality to something like this tastes good or this tastes bad, this smells good, this smells bad. Um, and quantitative is something that you can measure. Um, for example, color of, of things or um, the weight of a mouse or the amount of yield that you get from a certain crop. Um, knowledge is something which is different from data and that is something that in biology often goes wrong. Many biologists think that data is knowledge. So as long as you can collect enough data, um, then knowledge comes by itself, but that's not the case. There's a big difference. So knowledge is generally um, described as a um, awareness or understanding of something. All right, we have another Florian says how to analyze chipset data would be really interesting. Um, okay, I will put it on the chipsec on the list. Um, there's currently no chipsec because um, the current core structure follows kind of the biological dogma. So you have DNA causing RNA, causing proteins. Um, and when you talk about chipsec, you generally talk about like epigenetics. So stuff around the DNA, modifications of the DNA. So yeah, I will, I will see if I can make a nice lecture about chipsec data. All right, so knowledge, familiarity or awareness of an understanding of, of, of a process or of a, of a um, um, a, a, a system. Um, then generally we use the term when we talk about bioinformatics we use the term in silico um, so when you do a prediction and you do that on the computer it's an in silico product, uh, pr prediction yeah, which is so it's something that is tested or can be tested on a computer um, and normally yeah, we we can compare this to terms like in vivo, so doing an experiment in a live animal, or in vitro, uh, doing an experiment in a lab setting. Um, yeah, so these things generally um, are mean the same thing. So in silico means in a computer, in vivo means in a living animal, and in vitro means that you do it more or less in a lab setting. So you kind of remove the live part from the, uh, from, from the equation. All right, so when we talk about bioinformatics, um, we always have to talk a little bit about history. I, I, if I wouldn't have become a bioinformatician, um, then I would probably have become a history teacher because I love history. Um, and um, I think history is important. Um, and there's this quote um, from John of Salisbury, um, standing on the shoulders of giant, we can see more than them. Um, and it's very important to know where we are coming from. Um, so have when we when we talk about bioinformatics, we have two histories. One is the history of computers. Um, so when you follow the R course, we go much further back. We start at like 2000 years before Christ um, when we talk about computers. But for bioinformatics, I'm thinking that, well, we should keep it simple. And we start at around 1800. Um, and of course, we start with Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage is someone who is called the father of modern computers or the father of the modern computer um, and that is because he designed something which is called the analytical engine. So the analytical engine is a computer made out of cog wheels and ropes and pulleys um, and it is a fully functioning 
computer. So it has all the parts that a normal computer of today more or less has, um, and hey, it is an it 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 is not a machine that was built during his lifetime. No, it was a machine that he designed on paper. Um, so it's just a theoretical machine. Um, but um, Ada Lovelace, um, one of the first computer programmer, she wrote um, algorithms for his computer. So she took his kind of schematical drawings of the analytical engine, and then she designed computer programs to run on this machine. One of the nice things is, is that she is considered to be the first computer programmer in the world um, and she also designed the first algorithms um, and she's also the inventor of recursive algorithms. So recursive algorithms are more or less um, algorithms which call themselves. Um, so here we will have a lecture about recursion or not so much about recursion, but recursion will pop up. Um, and uh, recursion is a very efficient way of solving questions. So um, for people that follow the R course, they already had more or less a recursion lecture. Um, and we will have, or I will point out during the coming lectures where a recursion can really help us speed up things compared to uh, just using standard iterative loops. Of course, the third person that you have to mention when you talk about the history of computers is Alan, Alan Turing. Um, so Alan Turing is more of a common day uh, figure, um, but he is the father of theoretical computer science. So theoretical computer science is the science of what you can compute and what you can't compute. Um, and this is very abstract in a way. Um, but um, to make it more physical, he developed something like a Turing machine. And again, a Turing machine, like the analytical engine, is not a real machine. It doesn't exist in real life um, because you need an infinite tape for it. And of course, infinity doesn't exist in the world. Um, but by using this Turing machine, we can reason about what things we can compute and which things we cannot compute. Um, so Alan Turing... Um, I think he's mostly known for cracking the Enigma machine during the Second World War. Um, but in computer science, this is just one of his minor accomplishments. Um, his major accomplishment is the inventor of the uh, is the invention of the Turing machine. So this machine, which allows us to reason about, can we compute this, or are we not able to compute this? Um, and of course, there are questions which you are never able to compute, like what is the meaning of life, the universe and everything is one of these questions which of course is incomputable because it's not a very well defined question. So if we go um, and show you these things, um, the analytical engine is on the left side. Um, this is a, a replica made in the 1990s. Um, so in the time when Charles Babbage was living, they were not able to make this machine because of the fact that they didn't have these nice fancy CNC machines. Um, so the quality of iron was not like the quality of iron and steel that we have today. So it was very difficult for them to cut uh, cog wheels that were small enough to fit in this, in this machine. Um, and on the right side, we see kind of a Turing machine. So a Turing machine is a very simple machine, which has a, um, um, which has a, um, a head which reads numbers on a tape and it has a memory to recall some of these numbers and it has a kind of programmable component and we're based on the input which you read on the tape you can do certain computations um, which are pre-programmed into the machine um, but had both of these machines are more or less more or less theoretical machines so hey the, the, the analytical engine was built but only like 200 years after um, Charles, uh, after Babbage, um, and it turns out that it actually works. So if you build one physically, then it, it works, and you can use the old algorithms that Ada Lovelace made um, to run on this machine and get an answer. Um, and the Turing machine, of course, an infinite tape is not possible, um, but there are very nice simulations online uh, where you can simulate a Turing machine, and uh, that will allow you to reason about what you can compute and what you cannot compute. 
All right, so then when we talk about the first real computer, there's a little bit of a disagreement. So if you ask Americans who made the first computer, the Americans will say, well, that is the ENIAC. Um, but if you ask anyone else in the world, then they should give you the correct answer. And the correct answer is, is that the first computer was built by Konrad Zeus in 1941. Um, so he is the inventor of the first working, programmable, fully automated digital computer. Um, so you can see here Konrad Zeus and you can see the Z3, the replica in the Museum of München. Um, and this machine was built to study wing flutter. So wing flutter is the process at when you fly very very fast with an airplane and you reach the speed of sound um, then your wings start flapping if you use standard wings which they used slightly before and in the Second World War. Um, so had they designed this machine to specifically be able to design like jet fighters which would be able to go faster than the speed of sound. Um, and um, of course there was also a Z1 and a Z2, um, but those are not real computers um, because they weren't fully automatic, uh, weren't fully uh, programmable. So they would have part of their programming pre-installed, kind of pre-baked into the machine, so they weren't like general use machines. Um, but the, uh, the original Z3 was of course destroyed during an Allied bombing run in Berlin in 1943, so it only existed for two years. Um, so how would you communicate with this machine? So communication with this machine happens with these kinds of things. Um, these are punch cards, and punch cards um, are something which if you are old enough you can still remember from when you went to the hospital um, they would give you this little card and that would contain your information and also the things that you would do. Um, so it's just a little piece of paper or plastic um, which has little holes in there. Um, you stick it into the machine, the machine has these mechanical um, well kind of read out um, and by pulling the card through the machine it reads out the information on the card. Um, so I don't know if anyone's still old enough to remember this like the first time that I went to the hospital um, um, I, I can still remember having this card and having to take this card with me from like station to station and everywhere they would put it in like one of these slots and the machine would read it and then they would kind of be able to have an overview of my uh, of my medical data. Um, I don't think that anyone uses punch cards anymore, but it is it, it had been um, the, uh, the the oldest way of, of really interacting with computers. Before we had keyboards and mice, um, you would make these punch cards and then you would run the punch cards through the machine. Um, there's some really funny YouTube videos um, about people using these old machines with with these punch cards to do things like play Return to Castle Wolfenstein or play Doom on, on them. Um, so it's a really interesting way of, of programming. Yeah, it's good to see that at least one person in chat still remembers the old punch card systems. Alright, so the next very important person in the history of bioinformatics or the history of biology is um, um, John von Neumann. Uh, John von Neumann is uh, very famous because he designed the architecture of the modern computer. Um, so every modern computer that you have on your desk, including your mobile phone and, and other things, uh, they should actually be called von Neumann machines, but we don't call them von Neumann machines because computers is just easier. Um, but his idea was that when you make a computer, a computer needs to consist of four very fundamental parts. Um, so um, had the, the, the picture that you see here with the central processing unit, the input device, the output device, um, in the 19, um, in the 19 50s, uh, this was enough to have a very high scoring impact publication um, had just by drawing this little figure with like a couple of boxes um, he was able to kind of make a name for himself. Um, so had four parts is you have to have an input device, you have to have an output device, um, this is to communicate with the user, um, and besides that you need to have a central processing unit and you need to have a memory unit. So the memory unit of course stores data, intermediate data, and the central processing unit uh, 
has a control unit so the control unit tells the computer what is the next operation that you should do um, and there's an arithmetic logic unit uh, which allows the computer to compute things like what is 5 plus 5 um, but the other part is the logic unit which allows it to reason uh, using boolean logic so boolean logic is like um, if it rains and this, uh, um, if it rains, then there are clouds. Um, but if there are clouds, it doesn't have to rain. And so it's kind of a, a an, you have like different Boolean operators to reason about uh, logic. So to kind of make a prediction. Um, we will have a little bit of a comeback to how a, a logic unit and, a, and, a, and an arithmetic unit works. Um, but just remember, computers um, should be called von Neumann machines. And this is because of this guy saying that a computer should consist of four parts. All right, so that's kind of how far I want to go. It's just a very brief overview of, of the history. Um, and. Uh, there's of course a lot more people involved in the in the development of computers, um, but I think that when you talk about computers and you talk about bioinformatics, you should at least mention these uh, five people. Um, yeah, so Babbage, Ada Lovelace, uh, you should mention Turing. Hey, you should talk about John von Neumann and you should talk about Konrad Zuse. Hey, of course there's many many different things that you can talk about the history of computers. Hey, there's also very exciting things happening currently which might greatly impact stuff in the future like the development of the d-wave machine which is a quantum computer um, but I, I think in general um, had just learning these five people um, and what they did and how they contributed to the field of computers and or of computer science uh, you get an, a general idea um, so do look up these people when you are studying the lecture and read a little bit about their lives on Wikipedia um, because there might be questions about what they did and why they are so important. So if we talk about bioinformatics, bioinformatics is a much, much younger, younger field. Like computer science in general is considered to be a relatively young field as well because it's only like 250 years old um, yeah, so in the scientific community things like chemistry and physics are considered very old fields um, similar to mathematics which is two to three thousand years old um, but bioinformatics is, is very very young so the, the the birth of bioinformatics is more or less in the 1960s when we started having like computers available to people at universities um, and that's also when we first see the term bioinformatics appearing. Um, so the term bioinformatics was coined around 1960 um, when people in biology were thinking about using these newfangled machines that they had available at their universities uh, to analyze data and to, to start um, using computers, so computer science together with informatics. Alright, so a couple of molecular techniques and accomplishments I want to go through which are really important. Uh, like in 1972 we have the first bacteriophage sequenced. Um, this is an RNA bacteriophage, so a bacteriophage is a little single-stranded RNA virus um, that affects um, bacteria. Um, so Generally, when you search for what is a bacteriophage, you see this nice icosahedron structure um, with these little legs. Um, it docks to the to the um, to the bacteria and then injects the RNA into the bacteria. The RNA replicates, so hey, proteins will be produced. RNA will be uh, will be uh, duplicated, um, and at a certain point, the bacteria is full of phages and it bursts open, and all the other phages come into um, the surrounding area and are able to infect new bacteria. Um, so this one was one of the first things that we sequenced um, and uh, or to completely sequence. Um, so the whole genome of this bacteriophage is very small. It's only like three and a half thousand base pairs or three and a half thousand nucleotides. Um, but it is the first complete sequence genome, first RNA sequence genome. So then in 1977 um, we were able or bioinformatics well, not so much bioinformatics, but in biology, people sequenced the first or the first DNA virus, which was bacteriophage Phi X174, or um, and uh, this is the first sequenced DNA genome. It's around five and a half thousand nucleotides long, and this one is very interesting because it is still used 
every day all across the world as a positive control during sequencing experiments. So if you have like a big Illumina X10 sequencer which can sequence like 10 humans a day, um, then still the positive control is this little bacterial phage uh, which was first sequenced in 1977. Um, which I always think is interesting that people 50 years after sequencing it, they still use the DNA of this phage um, as a positive spike in uh, for, um, for doing sequencing analysis. We have to wait 10 years for a very new uh, thing to appear and those are the spotted microarrays. So the spotted microarrays are a major step forward in biology um, because they allow us to kind of get a read on um, on genes and the expression of genes. And, uh, if you have a, a genome um, or if you have an animal then hey, of course you have the DNA level which encodes all the information and then you have the RNA level which transports this information into the protein world where uh, proteins are effector molecules. Um, so using a spotted microarray uh, we had the ability to kind of measure the activity of several genes. Um, so they used to be spotted in the university. My old university had a old spotting microarray machine in the basement and this machine would um, give little pieces of DNA, put it on a little glass plate and then you could use this glass plate to um, analyze the expression level of genes. So um, and this is something that was a major step forward because now we could really see the activity of the genome. So instead of looking at static sequences and looking at DNA sequences and protein sequences, we were now able to see kind of what a genome was doing live. And so under different conditions you can do microarrays and you can get an idea of which genes are more active when there's salt around, which genes are more active when, for example, the temperature is up. Um, and this of course has led to a massive understanding of how biology works and what the function of several genes are. In the 1990s DNA shotgun sequencing was developed um, and DNA shotgun sequencing is one of the most used technologies nowadays. Um, so it consists of chopping up like a massive genome, like a human genome, into very small pieces, um, then sequencing all of these small pieces and then reassemble them. And this can be done in parallel. Um, and that's the big advantage because hey, normally when you would do sequencing you would sequence base pair by base pair, um, but using these things um, you can... Um, wait a second... Let's not have my phone buzzing here. All right. Um, and so you chop the genome up into small pieces um, and then you, you sequence these small pieces um, at the same time. So instead of having to go base pair by base pair, um, hey, you have a million little pieces and each of these million little pieces you read base pair by base pair, uh, meaning that you can do it a million times faster than normal sequencing methods. Um, that's also why it became the default sequencing method. So in 1995, uh, influenza was sequenced, which is of course a major, um, well, kind of advantage for uh, making new influenza vaccines. Um, and it is the first free living organism um, to have its entire genome sequenced. Um, and it consists of around two, two million uh, nucleotides, DNA of course. Um, 1995 uh, also saw the miniaturization of microarrays for real gene expression studies, uh, which means that instead of measuring 100 or 150 genes, you are now able to measure uh, uh, 20,000 to 50,000 genes in one go. Um, and it also allows you to look at, for example, things like splicing, hey, where a single gene is producing different mRNAs which produce different proteins. Um, and hey, by looking at the different parts of the gene, you can then get an idea of which of the different transcripts of a certain gene are expressed. So in 2003 is the next milestone. In 2003 the Human Genome Project was completed um, and this is um, one of the major advances in biology. 
Um, I cannot understate or overstate how important this is. Um, if you would think about the Human Genome Project, then it is kind of on par with um, something like the Manhattan Project. So it is kind of similar to the development of the of the atomic bomb. Um, it has the same impact in biology as more or less the Manhattan Project had on physics. Um, yeah, so what was what was done is over the course of 13 years. Um, sequencing and assembly of 3.4 billion nucleotides was done um, and it, before that we didn't know how many genes human had um, but then after sequencing and um, and identifying it we identified around 20,500 genes in the human genome um, which means that a human is very comparable to a mouse uh, when it comes to the number of genes. The total cost of this whole project is estimated to be somewhere between 3 billion and 10 billion. Um, so the total cost of 3 billion is kind of the lower bound estimate. Um, but it is one of the main accomplishments of um, like the new era. So hey, when we talk about like 2000 and up, um, then hey, the Human Genome Project completion is um, is one of the major, major advantages. And it, it's, it, it's something that's being used every day. And so when you talk about bioinformatics and talking about human medicine and then, then having this human genome project completed um, kind of allowed us to do things which we could not have done before. All right. So uh, why do we need bioinformatics? Um, well, in my view, we need bioinformatics because currently biologists can be considered data gatherers. Um, if I look at biologists, they generally tend to do experiments, 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 experiments. So they are collecting a lot of data, um, but they are unable to deal with these large amounts of data. All right, question from the audience. Uh, would quantum processors have a huge impact of the cost of genome sequencing? No. Uh, the major cost of genome sequencing at the moment is the chemicals. Um, the bioinformatics part after genome sequencing is relatively cheap. Um, the only thing which it could help us with is um, processing the amount of data more efficiently. Um, but that won't really change the, um, the cost because the major, major cost of sequencing is the chemicals that you need um, and I think that's around 80 to 85 percent of the cost while the computer part right the, the machine itself is very expensive but it lasts for dozens of years so you can spread out the cost of the machine over many many different sequencing runs um, so I, I really think that quantum quantum processors would not really help the cost of sequencing it would help with the speed it would probably help with the accuracy but it, it would not really impact the cost and cost of sequencing currently is already very low um, if you want to get yourself sequenced uh, you can do that probably for like 200 to 250 euros currently um, which is a steal if you want to get all of your genome done right if you think about things like Ancestry.com or uh, 23andMe, um, they, they offer you to to snip chip your genome, which is measuring very um, measuring variations, so generally like uh, 200,000 or 500,000 variations across the genome. Um, but you can have your whole genome sequenced for more or less twice or three times that cost. Um, and then you have all the base pairs, so all 2.6 billion base pairs, um, which is more information um, but it, things like structural variations and stuff also come into play then. So like I said biologists currently are data gatherers so they collect a lot of data like there's many biologists that say oh I want to do um, genome sequencing um, and then we're going to do microarrays to do gene expression analysis in five different conditions and we are using like six different species um, but at they have no real idea of how to analyze it, so they always have to collaborate with either people from uh, bio, uh, from uh, computer science or bioinformatics departments within a biology department. And so large amounts of biological data are collected, and then I'm thinking about things like DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing, um, expression analysis. Nowadays, when you talk about proteomics, um, it's also possible to measure 
well, thousands of proteins at the same time. Um, when you think about metabolomics, so the stuff which is not proteins, not RNA and not DNA, but still part of the cellular structure, um, and then we are also able to automatically measure like thousands of metabolites in a single run. Um, and of course we nowadays have automated phenotyping. And so that means for example that if I'm a plant scientist then I have like a, um, a conveyor belt. I put my plant on the conveyor belt and the plant is scanned using um, cameras. Um, other things of the plants are automatically determined, like the size of the leaves, the, 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 the size of the plant, and all of these things are automatically captured and just dumped into a massive database. And so we're talking about like gigabytes of data being collected from a single, single sample, um, which means that when you are analyzing a thousand plants, you end up with a couple of terabytes of data and generally when you are a normal biologist you're not able to deal with having hard drives and hard drives full of data being thrown on your desk. Um, so you need to have tools and you need to have skills to kind of analyze all of this data and to go from the data on the one part to the knowledge which is kind of what we want because in the end it's about pushing knowledge f forward. So uh, why do we need bioinformatics? Well, since there's a lot of automation in biological research, um, I always say like if you're studying biology now and you want to work in a lab, then probably that job will end in around 20 years. Um, there's so much robotization going on in big pharmaceutical companies and also biology companies. Um, if I think about uh, major breeding companies like Keygene, there's not that many people in the lab anymore. 90% of the research in these big companies is already done by robots. Um, so if your major skill is I'm very good at pipetting, um, then that is a skill which is still useful, but probably in 20 years this skill will be completely non-useful because robots will just be much better, much more precise and much more reliable than a human can ever be. Um, and we need also bioinformatics to distribute all of this data via the internet, um, which is getting to be a bigger and a bigger problem. Um, nowadays when you have like m large scale sequencing done in China, um, they will send you hard drives. They won't give you an FTP site where you can download the data and they don't have, they don't transmit this data over the internet because the data is just too big. Um, and that is something that is an active field of research in bioinformatics is how do we prepare and change the internet in such a way uh, that we can transmit this massive amount of data um, over the internet instead of having to send hard drives around. And so um, that's, a, that's a big issue. Um, and one of the other things which is really useful is that computing power is getting fast and cheap, very cheap at the moment. Um, so you can get like a 48 core machine with terabytes of, of memory um, for less than 10,000 euros. And so there's a lot of computing power available. Um, and then people always point to Moore's law and Moore's law says that computer speed doubles every 18 months. Um, but this is not true anymore. Um, in the last couple of years, um, companies like Intel and AMD have said that Moore's law is not holdable anymore. Um, one of the other laws that exist is the law of sequencing um, and that shows a, a more than exponential growth. So hey, we are able to sequence more today uh, than we were to sequence in the entire like five years before um, before that. So there's a more than exponential growth in the amount of sequencing done, while computer power only exponentially doubles every 18 months. Uh, meaning that with time progressing, we are less able to analyze all of the data coming out of sequencing, just because computers are not evolving fast enough compared to sequencing technology. So again there, coming back to Testosaurus, his question is quantum processors there would help a lot to kind of catch up um, with this battle between sequencing on the one hand and analysis of sequencing data on the other hand, where the analysis part is lagging behind um, more and more when time continues. 
So I've talked a lot about sequence and sequence is the origin of modern bioinformatics. So bioinformatics sequence is the fundamental data type um, as is in programming. Um, the fundamental data type of programming is the integer or the float or the pointer. Um, in, in bioinformatics we always start with the sequence. The sequence is where we kind of hang everything on. And so it is the entry point for many in silico studies, is just getting the sequence of the animal that you're interested in. And this is of course um, because the sequence is the thing that drives everything else. The DNA sequence that you have determines which RNAs you can produce, which determine which proteins you can produce in the end. And so that's why DNA, RNA and protein sequences are kind of fundamental uh, to any analysis that you do in bioinformatics. And of course whole, jo whole genome shotgun sequencing means that sequence alignment is the fundamental algorithm. So comparing sequences and saying these sequences are similar to each other or these sequences are different from each other and that is kind of what bioinformatics does in a way. And so sequence alignment is one of the major fundamental algorithm and we will have a whole lecture about sequence alignment and how it is done and what are the drawbacks and what are the advantages of some of the algorithms used there. All right, so I'm looking at the clock. We're at 55 minutes and I know that I have to stop the recording at around 60 minutes, otherwise it will be too big for Moodle. So um, what is a DNA sequence? Um, let's get a couple more slides done before we take a little break. So what is a DNA sequence? So for me, a DNA sequence is an electrophorogram. Um, when I started, this was the way that we looked at sequencing. Of course, we already had whole genome sequencing, but if when I started off and I sent something in for sequencing, then this is more or less what I got back. Um, so what I got back was like this profile where on the one axis you have the intensity um, of a certain color and on the other axis you have the genome sequence. And so um, you can see here a very common thing, eh, which is that you see a little peak. Eh, so this means that there was binding of the uh, of the C allele, um, meaning that the original sequence here had a G. Um, and on the opposite, you see that this so DNA sequencing when I started off was being done, um, and you still get these things if you if you do an uh, an experiment and you have a little piece of DNA after you did your PCR reaction and you want to send it in for sequencing, uh, then many things are still sequenced using um, electrophorograms. Um, so you just get one of these pictures back and then in this picture you can see, oh, okay, so this had to be a G, an A, a T, an A, um, and that, that is how you read a sequence. And of course, the height of these peaks also determines more or less the confidence that you have um, and have, there's many drawbacks here as well, but that, still the whole genome massive parallel sequencing still uses colors and optics to determine what the sequence of, of DNA is. Um, so hey, it's still very relevant. It's not as relevant as it used to be in 2010 when I started, um, but it's still the way to look at DNA sequences and to look at quality of sequencing results. All right, so since 1982, there's something called GenBank, and GenBank is kind of the place to store sequence data. Um, so just as a little comparison, in December 1982, we had 606 DNA sequences stored, and the total storage in GenBank was around 600, 680,000 base pairs. Um, if we look at GenBank now, um, so the last statistics from October 2020 are is that we have around 100, uh, 219 million sequences stored there um, with a total of, well, I'm not even able to say this number, but it's like 700,000 million base pairs, which is just an insane amount of, of sequencing data. It just thinking about how much this is, hey, if you look at a megabyte, so a megabyte is one million, hey, so that would mean that this is then a, a gigabyte, so that, that hey, if, you would, if you would be able to store base pairs into a single 
byte, which you can't because you actually need eight bytes for them, and then, then you at least need a full hard drive um, to at least store all the data from Genbank, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to remember that all of these base pairs also come with things like quality scores and they come with annotation. So all of this data needs to be stored. And this is really like one of these numbers which is growing exponentially. Um, if you want to see the curve or you want to have more uh, information, then you can you can click on the link there and see how this exponential curve grows um, since 1982 up until 2020. Uh, um, and it's really a big wave. And hey, if you then plot Moore's law or the speed of a computer core, you can see that this is growing much, much faster um, than the average speed of a CPU, which is used to analyze this data. Um, so just an overview of which species are in Genbank. And so we have humans, uh, mouse, uh, rats and cows and those are the main species um, in Genbank. And of course at this data all of these base pairs that we have stored uh, they mean nothing if you do not have annotation. If you do not have like knowledge projected on DNA sequences, DNA sequences are more or less useless. Um, and, but it's just a little overview. But of course, humans and mice are the most important animals, uh, closely followed by rats and cows. Um, rats, because they are very much used in, in, in medicine research. And of course, cows, because they are one of the main uh, species um, that, that is used in agriculture. Um, and also, um, uh, ZMAs and Suscrofa, so um, Suscrofa are um, pigs, and they are very important species for our production systems. Um, so they, they, they have a big part of their sequences uh, targeting these species. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording and take a little break. We're not exactly at the point where I expect it to be, so we're a little behind, but I think we can catch up in the second hour. Um, are there any questions so far, um, then just throw them in the chat and I will answer them when I get back. And in the meantime, um, you guys uh, can enjoy the first break kind of slideshow that I have for you guys. So I will be back in like 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> 